Hello and welcome to my channel. Thank, Thank you, you for being here today. Today I have a special presentation. We're going to be talking about finding inspiration for your art. Uh, this is a departure from my usual live presentations where I talk about techniques. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about inspiration and how to go about finding it. Uh, this is a difficult thing for most artists today. That, uh, we're living in difficult times, uh, slammed by images daily uh, via internet or you know uh, television. So it's really difficult to find inspiration nowadays as an artist. And I'm going to be talking about how to go about some tips on how to find ways to inspire yourself to maintain you know uh, a, a focus on your work. So this is really important. Uh, for any young artist that is wanting to get started, you know, creating your own paintings and wanting to exhibit your works. So I'm going to be talking about some tips uh, and some references, too. So um, I want to start by sharing some books with you guys that, are, that have been helpful in my development as an artist. Uh, and you could get these books from uh, the kit that I have shared in the description below. Uh, and also through any other uh, internet source. So I want to share this wonderful little book, Nature and Its Symbols. Okay, This is a wonderful little book that you could uh, download or uh, perhaps purchase from Amazon. A uh, wonderful little book that has, it, it's, it's almost like a dictionary of symbols. Uh, and why am I suggesting this book? Well, because um, there was a time uh, during uh, the Baroque era and the Renaissance, where artists well, were, were well versed in uh, symbolism uh, for their art. So um, today, a lot of artists do not uh, perhaps think about that. But uh, in the old days, this was very important, spe specifically because of the uh, symbolisms involved in religious art. And this is, uh, you know, probably one of the most important things for. Uh, Renaissance artists. Uh, and before I get uh, started, uh, I want to say hello to uh, Mick. Uh, thank you for being here, Mick. And Mithat, thank you for being here. Thank you, Bran. And uh, Matthews, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying your, uh, your name correctly. But, uh, and Tommy as well. Thank you for being here. I appreciate the visit. Uh, hopefully, we can learn a few things. And I want to invite everyone to uh, comment if you uh, haven't done so or if you're feeling maybe uh, a little shy. Uh, that's why the channel's here. Uh, it's a, a way to communicate with other artists. And I also want to know what inspires you guys uh, to make art. So uh, throughout the presentation, if you have a, a comment or uh, you know, perhaps a suggestion, uh, you know, uh, I'm always welcome. Uh, you know, your comments are always welcome. So, um, all right, so let's just get started with just some books that uh, I'm going to be uh, referencing. Um, and these are just uh, classical books that you could find on the internet. Another wonderful book that is, has been highly influential to uh, my development as an artist is The Ain't It's, uh, you know, just a classical book that a lot of artists from the Renaissance and from the past have used. Uh, Metamorphosis is, uh, by Ovid is another wonderful book that was used by a lot of classical painters. Um, and before I get started, I, I want to share some images, um, particularly of uh, one of my favorite artists, Velasquez. Um, and uh, Velasquez, uh, he uh, painted The Forge of Vulcan, which is a translation or an adaptation from Ovid's Metamorphosis. Uh, this is one of my favorite, all-time favorite paintings. Uh, it's uh, probably one of the most modern paintings uh, in, in terms of subject matter. Even though it doesn't, it's a, it's a mythology, but it almost feels like. Uh, well, here in Spanish, we have telenovelas, which is uh, you know. A, 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 a drama sitcom uh, based on real life uh, tragedies or real life dramas. And uh, this is probably the first painting that I believe uh, in the history of art that there's really it's almost like a telenovela going on. Uh, and it, it's, 
it has to do with uh, betrayal. It's a painting that um, uh, touches on the idea of, you know, infidelity. So here's Apollo coming to tell Vulcan of uh, news of infidelity. And, uh, and I love this painting because the moment in which Velasquez captures this scene, and uh, it, it's almost like time stops in this, uh, in this uh, theater of characters. Uh, and you can observe the workers, everybody's in pause waiting for Vulcan's reaction. And that is just genius for an artist to sort of um, almost predict the, 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 the age of film, which is what we're, today we're, you know, we have film and we take that for granted. Um, but in the age of Velasquez, uh, you know, uh, artists were, uh, you know, uh, drawing inspiration from either uh, the Bible uh, or uh, mythology. And this is a, a popular theme. I want to show you uh, uh, the, an, an engraving by Antonio Tempesta. Uh, he's uh, an Italian artist. And if, if you haven't noticed the similarities here, uh, look at the, how the composition is very similar. So Velasquez uses this engraving as inspiration for his painting. Um, he takes the figure of Apollo, places it in a very similar compositions, compositional scheme, and he adds more figures. Even the, the, the figure of Vulcan is very similarly compo composed. So um, uh, even from the old days, from the past, uh, uh, you know, artists, we can learn how they're adapting themes, they're adapting compositions, and they're borrowing compositions from earlier artists. And this is probably one of the easiest ways to get started to find inspiration for your own work. Uh, this is a technique that I learned uh, at the Pennsylvania Academy. I had some amazing teachers there uh, in the 90s, uh, one of them being uh, Sidney Goodman, uh, uh, very influential teacher to a lot of American artists. Um, and he was a primarily a narrative painter. And uh, he always uh, told me that art is born from experience. Um, and drawing from your own experiences is very really important. Uh, so that was instrumental to my development as an artist. And also I see that when studying classical works, I see that a lot of artists are not just copying the works of past artists, they're, they're interpret, reinterpreting the works, they're appropriating the image, meaning that this is uh, an image where Velasquez is just looking at the composition and finding ways to improve on that composition and on that theme. So um, the, even though it's not an original idea of his, but he takes that composition and, and transforms it into you know, a more powerful scene by having all the spectators sort of just stare at Vulcan as he's, you know, striking down on this piece of metal and just, you know, there's fear in the air and Velasquez captures that uh, quite nicely. I, I, and I really enjoy that when studying works of art. I enjoy how artists bring their own um, interpretation to the theme. And that is just, it, it, that is, essentially for me what art is, is bringing your own experience to uh, the painting, to the work. Uh, I want to share another image uh, from another great artist that I, I, that I highly admire. Uh, Goya is probably one of my most favorite artists. Um, this is the 3rd of May, painted in about uh, 1818. Um, wonderful painting. Uh, it's a chronicle of uh, the invasion uh, and uh, a lot of the atrocities that the French committed in, in, during the uh, Spanish uh, invasion. Uh, and um, Koya captures this almost like a theatrical theme. And that's what I really enjoy about classical painting is the theatrical aspects of the lighting, uh, how the compositions are arranged. Uh, they're not, you know, there's a lot of thought process behind these paintings. There, there's figures, there's models. There's arrangement. There's a lot of thought process in the composition, the movements, the lighting. So um, here you have a grouping, a mass grouping, very organized, that is sort of attempting uh, against life, against these uh, 
uh, poor uh, Spaniards, you know, that are uh, being oppressed by uh, an invading army. Um, and Goya captures those atrocities just in an amazing way. Like no other artist, I believe, has done us uh, uh, before or, or, or after. So um, now there is another artist from the 19th century that took this painting as an inspiration. Uh, Manet uh, uh, painted uh, the execution of Max, Emperor Maximilian. Uh, this painting is from about 1837 uh, or 67, excuse me, 1867. And look at how uh, Manet uh, just completely copies the composition. But he's not just, you know, uh, making an exact replica. He's lighting up, he's, he, uh, Lighten up the palette slightly. He uh, reduced the amount of figures and he places the figures behind the wall. Uh, that uh, a grouping of figures that Goya places right next to uh, the uh, group that is being you know executed. Uh, he moves behind the wall. It's almost ex spectators. And I love details like that. That's really what makes uh, these paintings compelling. And uh, in my own work, I, I'm always finding ways to make the work compelling. Uh, I want a work that is powerful, that the narrative uh, carries, you know, a message uh, that is, you know, uh, beyond the technical means of the painting. And that's one of the things that I, in my own classes, I, I'm always talking about that with my students. That's what I learned at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. There's a great history of narrative paintings that, that has come from the Academy. And... Um, this is a, a departure, perhaps, from a lot of contemporary work that, uh, or contemporary art that is perhaps not as narrative or is not drawing from, uh, you know, stories or liter uh, literary pieces uh, to draw from, inspiration from. But I believe that some of the greatest paintings, uh, you know, painted throughout the, the history of art were derived from great stories from great experiences from tragic experiences and that's something that I myself uh, use as inspiration for my own work and I'm telling you about this because a lot of artists today because we're so consumed with constant images uh, it's really really difficult to decipher which images you're going to be inspired by I mean we're sort of slammed by images uh, every day through our phones, through television, through film. So it's very difficult to sort of distill those images and to uh, draw inspiration from them. So um, one of the best ways that a lot of artists uh, in the past uh, uh, learned how to distill these images or uh, you know, be inspired by these images was to travel. Traveling is probably one of the best ways to, uh, to be uh, in contact with the work, to experience, uh, you know, being in front of that painting. And for myself, that has been the case. I have uh, traveled extensively in Europe. Um, I, I, I uh, won a scholarship in 1997 from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And that was a very, very important experience for me. And I want to share with you guys uh, some uh, video uh, of my uh, last trip to Italy. This trip was uh, very influential uh, to me because um, I was, for the first time, I had the opportunity to sort of, you know, not, not go there to, uh, to study particularly, but, you know, just to sort of take in the art and just be around it and to uh, dare to look at other types of art. You know, uh, I'm, I'm very much interested in narrative painting. But in this last trip, this, I, the trip was about two years ago before the pandemic, um, and I was able to travel in the, in the central part of Italy and also the south, Naples, and also uh, traveled extensively in Sicily. Um, and the, these experiences were fundamental to, the, to my current development, my work. Um, I uh, had never been in contact with a lot of the frescoes that were... Uh, you know, uh, painted during the Renaissance in Florence. I was able to study some of those, such as the frescoes of Perugino, which I'm going to share with you. 
Uh, and also, I found a, a new interest for Michelangelo, which I, I, I always loved Michelangelo. But uh, I, I was able to, to absorb his mannerism uh, and try to sort of understand a little bit more uh, profoundly what he was trying to do with anatomy. So um, just to talk a little bit about my own work in the context of the old masters, um, this painting that you see behind me is a work in progress, and that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, this painting is not quite finished. Uh, I'm still working through it, but um, I want to sh share the, the evolution of this painting. Um, this is a departure for me. I usually have a very somber palette. I don't use such bright colors, uh, you know, such as this intense red. But I, I found myself, when you know, studying a lot of these works uh, from the Renaissance, I found myself really studying how the color was used, especially very bright colors, symbolic colors. Um, and these colors uh, were used by Renaissance masters to communicate that, you know, that, that idea of purity or uh, you know, uh, sacrifice or perhaps, you know, passion. So um, the, the, I, I would say one of the most important things, you know, uh, for Renaissance artists was uh, the symbolic use of color. And that's something that I, I had never explored in my work. And uh, surprisingly, it creeped up in my latest work. Um, I uh, found myself working with fresco painting uh, for a commission. And uh, the fresco color is very, very intense. And it almost feels like glazing in a lot of ways. Um, and that's uh, really the, the way that I uh, started working uh, in my latest work with a lighter ground, uh, the, a light grayish ground, which is the, the ground that I use for this painting behind me. And I want to share with you, uh, before I start the video, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the theme. Uh, you'll see that uh, there's a, uh, a theme that is, you know, uh, recurring in a lot of these paintings, and it's the idea of uh, maternity, the idea of uh, power uh, in, in women, um, and uh, motherhood as well. And uh, this, this theme is uh, important to me because uh, I was raised... Uh, by single mother, and uh, there's you know uh, a connection to that theme. Um, so uh, this is a painting a, a self portrait that I wanted to to uh, to paint, uh, but in a different context, using symbolic uh, metaphors, and um, it, it's an experiment. And I know that a lot of artists, uh, perhaps today, are probably uh, hesitant to. Uh, draw inspiration perhaps from classical themes, but it's always refreshing to go back to revisit some of these great artists because the themes are universal. They're important. And um, the technique, all the technique that I talk about uh, here in the channel uh, has to have a purpose, uh, an expressive purpose. So that's important. Um, meth I have a question from Method. Uh, is it painted on linen? Yes, this is a uh, linen canvas. Uh, it's a very fine weave linen, uh, and I used uh, a, a lead ground uh, bound with uh, chalk, uh, excuse me, a lead, lead ground uh, with half chalk, half lead, and bound in linseed oil. So, um, and it's, it's uh, pumice very smoothly, so the painting has sort of a smooth quality. So. Um, thank you for uh, your question, Method. I hope I'm saying your, your name correctly. Um, and thank you for joining. So um, I have this video. I prepare a video with some images from my travels. Uh, all the photography and videos, uh, my own photography uh, from the museum. So um, you'll see some close-ups of some paintings that I really enjoy and that have influenced my vision, uh, specifically in this painting behind me. So I'm going to show you uh, some images, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of the process uh, when starting this uh, this painting behind me. So, all right, let's take a look at that uh, video. Um, so this is a, a video of Naples, a city that I absolutely love, uh, and of course the influence of Caravaggio. I was able to see some amazing Caravaggio altarpieces in Naples. Here's one that I absolutely love. 
And um, there's a particular detail of this painting. There's a detail that I just love. I love how powerful this scene is. Um, from there, I went to, uh, I, this is um, Sicily, Palermo. And in Palermo, I was able to, this is Antonello della Messina, a wonderful painting by Antonello della Messina. And of course, Michelangelo's Pieta. Just a beautiful piece in Rome. This is uh, the Entombment of Christ by Caravaggio. And this is, this is a preliminary sketch, uh, thumbnail sketch that I did in preparation for this painting using, uh, inspired by uh, the themes of motherhood and uh, the uh, Pieta of Michelangelo. Um, this is a, another painting uh, from the Renaissance uh, from Leonardo. Uh, the Adoration of the Magi, and this is the beginning of my process. From there, I uh, created a study uh, of the head just to sort of get that emblematic face, uh, uh, you know, of so the universal face uh, of the Renaissance. Um, and there you see how I start the painting with uh, just some diluted paint. Here's another wonderful uh, image of Perugino. There you see that the, it, there's not really much of an underpainting. It's just a gray ground, and I'm just working. Uh, this is uh, Bronzino, wonderful, wonderful painting by Bronzino. Um, and here you see how I'm just using that straight color um, and influenced by Titian, of course, as well. And this is a painting in development, so it's just a preview of um, a painting that I'm working on. And uh, of course, just working through the Giornatos, uh, little by little, just uh, in another wonderful iconic image from the Renaissance to remind us all of that sort of beautiful, uh, uh, you know, downward stare that is just so emblematic uh, of, the, of the, you know, uh, quintessential Renaissance uh, mother, uh, which I, I absolutely love. Um, so, um, you know, the, just ways to get inspired by just studying art and traveling. Um, now, you don't have to uh, travel. You could essentially uh, draw inspiration from books. Um, I believe I have another uh, question here from Mick. Uh, thank you, Mick, for asking uh, or for sharing your question. Um, do you put an imprimatur over the ground? So... I usually do, but in this case, I did not. This is a, a gray ground, a fully opaque gray ground. I very much like the Vermeer demonstration that I did here uh, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. Um, it's just, you know, a paste of uh, lead white with chalk, uh, umber and white, uh, excuse me, umber and black. Um, and I just mix a very, very uh, light gray and I just, uh, with a palette knife, scrape it smooth onto the surface, and um, I just start working with diluted paint and solvent, uh, in this case, spike oil of lavender. Um, and I, I did start the drawing with some initial charcoal uh, or vine charcoal, but then immediately I go to uh, the diluted uh, umber uh, and black paint, uh, and I'll wash in the shadows. Uh, it's a pretty standard uh, technique that I've shared here in the channel before. Um, you could put an imprimatur over a gray ground. That is That has been done. Now, really important to, um, and just to bring that sort of, you know, um, metaphorical aspect to the, to the work. Uh, if you're going to use a dark ground, then what is the reason for using a dark ground? Are you uh, wanting to express more of a, you know, a, a, a deeper sense of chiaroscuro or a, a dramatism, you know, in your work? Um, in this case, is it's a it's a scene that is, you know, uh, a compassionate uh, scene, you know, a painting of uh, of maternity. So I didn't want a very dark ground, uh, although Caravaggio certainly uses a dark ground. But there, I like to use technique to sort of accompany my expression as an artist. 
I, and that's why I'm so obsessed with technique. Uh, technique in the service of expression, right? So um, it's something that I learned um, at school by my teachers. And, um, and I believe that the old masters practice this. I mean, this is, uh, when you look at a, a early painting of, by Velasquez, uh, it's painted on a, dark, on a very dark ground. And then by the end, he was using almost a white ground. Um, he was, you know, interested in, in coloristic effects. So uh, perhaps, you know, the dark ground was not going to be serviceable to, uh, to explore those coloristic effects that he was, you know, so interested in. So same thing with Impressionism. So um, always have a, a reason to use technique. Uh, you know, why are you using a, a dark ground? Uh, so I have another question here from uh, Pablo. Pablo, thank you for joining. Um, let's see, can you add translation on Spanish, please? Eh, Pablo, eh, gracias por eh, tu pregunta, eh, gracias por el, la sugerencia. Eh, vamos a ver cómo lo podemos hacer en un futuro. Eh, y eh, gracias por la sugerencia y perdona, ¿verdad?, que, que, lo, que el video pues, no está en español. Pero sí te invito a nuestros videos en Atelier San Juan Facebook, que ahí todos los, los, los segundos jueves del mes estamos en vivo en español. Eh, pero gracias por tu visita. Um, so, I have another um, uh, comment from Gerald. Hi, are you still working on the Vermeer? So the Vermeer, I've stopped working on the Vermeer uh, for now. I'm uh, focusing on my own work. But in, I, I am working on a video uh, course that will be dedicated to Vermeer. And it will, it will include the full video and the full demonstrations. Uh, that video will be available on uh, the Udemy server. So uh, for those of you that, we, uh, you know, that are interested, I will be posting a link in the future for that full course on Vermeer. Thank you for, for uh, coming by, Gerald. So, um, yeah, so in terms of the work in terms of the technique. Um, there has to be a marriage between expression and technique, in my opinion. Uh, and I, that's what I've studied, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the master works um, that I see, that I've seen in the museums. I, I always see technique being used in the service of expression. And the reason I say that is because today um, I, I see a lot of books, I see a lot of uh, videos, um, and yes, there's a lot of wonderful techniques used by artists, but hardly, uh, uh, you know, it, it's mentioned the idea of expression. And how, why are you using a gray ground, for example, or why are you using a dark ground? So these are very important aspects to your work, to your, uh, to, to your art and to your expression. So um, it's important to take into account, you know, uh, your own experiences as well. Um, I have drawn all throughout my life from my experiences as, uh, you know, as an artist, as a, as a human being living in, you know, a contemporary, uh, situation. Um, and I painted a lot of interiors for, for a while, uh, that focused on, uh, uh, relationships. So, um, let's see, um, uh, I have another question or another con or question from Method. Um, how long does it take to uh, to this step? Uh, how long does, how long it takes to this step? Um, so I'm assuming that you're uh, you're probably asking me how long did it take me up to this point, uh, or I'm assuming that's a question. Maybe you could correct me. Um, so yeah, so this this uh, right now uh, is about about a month, uh, month worth of work. Um, I usually will, will start with the thumbnails, okay? And I'll usually, the way that I work as an artist is that I'll start by just sketching, either doing oil sketches or, you know, just traveling or just by reading for a while, uh, just really uh, nurturing uh, my intellect and trying to uh, you know, be inspired by uh, work or even an experience. And from there, I will uh, respond to that experience and I'll start a process of thumbnails or sketches. And that is very common for a lot of artists, I believe. A lot of artists were um, uh, 
uh, using drawing as a departure point uh, to painting. Um, I have another question. Um, Matt, Matthews, what reference do you use when you start painting? Sketch from life model, photography, or imagination? Excellent question. Yes. Um, so I start the very, very first image is from imagination. The sketch that I shared with you uh, with uh, their sanguine is strictly from imagination. And I like to do it strictly from imagination. That's why you see that it's very sketchy. It's almost like a, you know, um, an imag imaginary drawing, a, a thumbnail. It almost feels like a comic book drawing. Uh, I was a big fan of comic books growing up. And uh, I, I loved, uh, you know, uh, books like How to Draw Comics a Marble Way, where they teach you how to do the thumbnails from your imagination. So I still use that uh, initial process. And I find it the, the most, the purest vision that you could draw from. Um, it's, you know, it's just it's an immediate uh, image from your imagination. And from there, once I have the thumbnail, then I will uh, either bring a model. Uh, and in this case, I did bring models. Uh, my, this is my lovely girlfriend. Uh, cheap pose and also a self-portrait and I will use either uh, I will do a live sketch like the one you saw in one of the demonstrations um, uh, specifically for the head and once I, I have a pretty good idea of where I am uh, you know where I'm going with the painting then I will start uh, you know narrowing down and maybe taking some more uh, photography uh, and from there, I will uh, do a collage. Um, and uh, usually, uh, you could do a collage in Photoshop, or uh, you know, you could do a collage with uh, figurines. I mean, I have these little figures that that are uh, you know made out of plastic, and I, I will arrange them and light them um, so I could get the lighting just correct. Uh, if perhaps you have to access to two models at a time, but this is where um, where I probably uh, differ in a lot of, you know, I, I like to differ from a lot of public opinion. Uh, there's a lot of figurative painters today that are using strict, strictly photographs, and they copy the photograph exact, and uh, they model everything, and uh, I'm done. Uh, I have a, a photographic image, and I don't like to do that. And I don't see that the old masters were doing that. I, I, I see that there was an, uh, what they call in Spanish an arreglo, an arrangement. Uh, the arreglo is really important because that arrangement results in a use of imagination of, of what the Italians call invenzione. Uh, the invenzione is quite literally, it translates to invention um, and or in Spanish arreglo. Uh, it's just the, the same as a musician taking a song and just, you know, making a, a, a new arrangement for, uh, or what they call here in YouTube, a cover. Uh, it's not a copy of the same song. The musician's bringing their poetry into, into the, the song, right? And that's something that, you know, it's so important to be able to depart from the initial inspiration, the image, that photography. So you're bringing, you're taking a photo, but you're not copying the photo. You're uh, perhaps creating a diagonal. I like to create a di diagonal in my compositions. Um, and this is, this will be a future live presentation. I believe there, I do have a live presentation that talks about the quadrant. Um, and I, I believe it's under narrative painting. So you could check that video out in, in where I talk about the quadrant. It's just essentially taking uh, your picture plane and dividing it in uh, either uh, quarters or thirds and using diagonals is something that was used uh, by the old masters. Let's see. Um, so I have another question here. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, so mastery. Uh, uh, it says, thank you, Lewis, for another inspirational live video. Uh, do you prefer, well, thank you for coming by, mastery. Thank you for commenting. Uh, do you prefer Kirsker over Tenebrism? Do these methods require different color palettes? Absolutely, yes. So wonderful question. So I, again, so it depends on what I'm painting, the subject that I'm painting. I'm very much interested in the, the 
that narrative initially. And that's why I shared with you guys uh, some images that were inspirational. So um, I sometimes I don't have a predetermined theme. That is one of the reasons that I'm doing this video because um, a lot of artists, it's, it's, this is probably one of the most difficult things, being creative day by day is probably the most difficult thing for most artists and musicians too. Uh, waking up and being creative, it's like, where do you get inspiration from? So um, I myself draw inspiration from uh, works that inspire me, that, you know, that I love, uh, themes that I love. And uh, usually the theme or the subject matter will dictate what technique or what ground or what, te you know, what uh, palette I'm using. Very important. Um, that's why I don't like to narrow down uh, painter's techniques because the way that the forge of Vulcan was painted is not the same as Las Meninas. Uh, so it, it's just a fact of life. Artists are exploring, they're experimental, they're interested in uh, a specific subject at a time and they will bring their, ex their uh, expression to that subject. Um, so uh, Velasquez uses uh, for Las Meninas, I believe, a red ochre, or excuse me, a white lead with just slightly tinted, uh, almost like a pinkish, whitish ground. Uh, and for the Forge of Vulcan, he uses almost like a brownish gray ground. So two very fundamentally different techniques. Um, Velasquez did travel in Italy. Uh, he did, he I, I believe he, uh, he traveled twice to Italy. And these trips, each trip is, is a world unto itself. Um, you're uh, being exposed to different painters, to different artists, to different scenes. So those experiences are going to shape who you are. And that's why it's so important to get out, to travel, to see great work. So um, that's my recommendation for my students. That's something that I've, I learned. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to win a travel scholarship from my school uh, in 1997. And I have been back to Europe many times uh, and always with a new focus. Uh, you know, this last trip, I was interested in religious painting in fresco. Uh, my first time that I went to Europe, I, I didn't, I had never seen uh, a, a Velasquez in person, you know, or a Titian. So when you see these paintings in person, they, they, they have a profound um, effect in you know, in your development as an artist, and uh, you know, you're you're changed forever. So, really important to to study great works, and uh, everything that I that I talk about here in terms of technique is in service to expression. Just remember that uh, when working with your own work, you know, try to draw from your own experiences. Try to uh, you know uh, pick the artists that you love. Um, I know that. Today we have a culture of contemporary art, uh, and I myself, uh, you know, uh, yes, I, I respect contemporary art. I, I like some abstract painting, but for myself, for my own taste, I, I really draw inspiration from uh, classical painting, uh, Baroque painting, and also from painters from the 18th and 19th centuries because they're mostly narrative in nature. So that's what I really enjoy. Um, and that's also, I mean, my love for comic books is narrative, you know, uh, it's because of the narrative. So, um, yeah, so, uh, but not every artist is the same. Uh, and, you know, just take your experiences, um, make sure to, you could use uh, some contemporary sources such as film. There's a lot of artists today that are using film uh, to draw from, inspiration from. So, um just make sure that you uh, do not copy that theme in particular or that composition. Try to bring something unique to it, you know, and uh, that's, you know, it's very, very difficult today to be, you know, an original. Um, uh, you, you, you're you either doing, uh, you know, a, a homage to or an appropriation of. So even in film, I mean, uh, so... These are, these are uh, wonderful ways to, uh, and you'll find yourself in a different place. I mean, when you draw inspiration from something, uh, you, you're going to tr 
transform it to the point where per perhaps there's nothing left of that original inspiration. So um, that, that is a healthy process, in my opinion. Uh, so if that's something that I do with my own work, and I recommend that, you know, if you're getting started, uh, now it's important to learn technique. Do not get me wrong. Um, I see a lot of schools today uh, teaching uh, classical techniques uh, to artists, to young students. And I myself, uh, you know, I'm very, very much involved in teaching. But it's important to also have a departure from that teaching and uh, from that education and create your own path, right? So, um, Alex, thank you for coming by. Um, let's see, how to avoid becoming too derivative and liberist when driving inspiration from old masters. That is, that <laughs> you have uh, asked the uh, million dollar question here. Um, absolutely, so yeah, how do, you, uh, how do you do that, Alex? It's very difficult. I, I believe that this studio is very much a lab, you know? Um, they, uh, that the word cliche, you know, always comes up in, in uh, art school um, and, uh, you know, and, and also in film school and, you know, in the arts in general. So how do you uh, retransform something that's already been created to, to something contemporary that is, you know, of today? Well, my uh, recommendation, I, in, you know, I myself, uh, you know, struggle with that. Um, I, I like to, uh, you know, depart from a specific theme and from there, I, I just evolve. You know, I just continue to, to look at the work, the painting uh, over a period of months. And, you know, it, it's important to be very critical um, and also to exhibit your work in a contemporary context. So, um, you know, uh, how do you do it? It's, I don't really have a formula, uh, except just keep working, um, uh, and do what you love. And, uh, I, I, I do what I love. I, I love, uh, pigments. I love narrative painting. I love, you know, uh, curious cure lighting. And in school, I was very adamant about that. And, you know, uh, my teachers kept telling me, well, stay away from the old masters and stay, you know, uh, uh, I had even, I had a teacher who told me, why do you even paint at all? Do photography. Uh, don't paint or don't use black. Uh, you, you, you probably, uh, <laughs> some of you watching uh, have heard that one before. Well, this is my opinion. Do what you love and uh, be yourself. Um, if you like Caravaggio, then study Caravaggio. You don't have to copy Caravaggio, but you could essentially learn uh, what are his strategies. Uh, he's, he's a genius, you know, in terms of light and shade, you know. You, you don't have to copy, uh, you know, his effects or his uh, colors or his compositions or his themes. But um, there's always something to learn from, from there. And the idea that something... Uh, because if it's derived from an old master, it's not contemporary, I believe is uh, probably a mentality that is sort of grounded uh, before the days of the internet. Uh, nowadays, we have access to everything. Uh, I mean, I could go get onto Google Arts and, and you know, study uh, paintings that I could never get to, uh, you know, in, in a museum. I could never get that close to a, museum, uh, to a painting in a museum. So um, uh, we, we are exposed to information and uh, we, everything's going on. Uh, people ask me all the time, like, why do you do uh, figurative work that is classical? Uh, that's not going on anymore. I was like, well, have you, have you been to YouTube lately or have you been to the internet lately? There's hundreds of artists returning to classical techniques. And, you know, uh, my opinion is to do what you love, whatever inspires you. Um, and if it's a film that you're inspired by, well, study, study it thoroughly and become a master, try to become a master at it, right? So I have another question here, uh, uh, Mithat. Uh, I'm going to buy Old Holland Flake White, but it says it has cremnus and zinc pigments in it. What do you think about zinc content in paints? Um, so 
Old Holland is uh, a wonderful paint. Um, I've used it for years. Um, there is uh, a reservation uh, among a lot of uh, restorers about sink white. Um, it, it doesn't perform as well as either titanium or Kremnitz. My suggestion is find a brand uh, that does not have the sink. Uh, it, there's plenty of brands. Um, I, I dare mention some of them. Uh, Williamsburg is a wonderful brand uh, of paint um, here in, in the States. Uh, maybe you, I don't know if, if you could uh, purchase this uh, brand in, you know, uh, in, in your neighborhood, but, uh, but you could get it probably from you know, a, a retailer on the internet. Um, another uh, great little company that is uh, producing some wonderful uh, materials is Natural Pigments, and they have some amazing uh, uh, pigments and, and paints, so you, you could check them out. So yeah, so, um, but if you insist in buying Old Holland, well, um, the flake white or the cremeness white is really, you know, it's, it's a very tough pigment, so I think you should be okay. Um, but, you know, you could also opt to make it yourself. And uh, it is toxic. Uh, I, I, you know, just be very careful with uh, these toxic pigments that I recommend on, on the channel. Uh, it's a disclaimer. I, I've, I have a lot of people writing in about the stack process lead white. And I do make it myself, but I am extremely careful with it. And I use a respirator, gloves. Uh, I, I handle it uh, underwater meaning that I put the pigment under water and then I, I grind it wet and I immediately take it to oil and never see, I never see the powder, the powder form. Um, so, um, you know, but there's many other brands that you could use on um, that. So thank you for the question and thank you for coming by. So, yeah, so um, there, today was a departure from our usual uh, live presentations about uh, in-depth uh, explorations of materials but it's important to give context to the audience about, um, you know, what are all these techniques about? You know, why are you exploring, you know, uh, gray grounds and red grounds and oils and this and that? Um, and my uh, opinion about it is that the technique has to be carried by your expression. So you're using technique to express yourself. And if you're using a dark ground, well, you know, you, you have a good reason for using a, a dark ground. If you're using, you know, a light ground, a light lead ground, well, why are you using that ground? I said because you want a brighter palette. You know, uh, the palette is fundamental. Yes, absolutely, the palette is fundamental. Uh, I like to use an earth palette. I like to use historical pigments because um, the pigments have a, a range that uh, they, they have a neutrality that I love. When you varnish these these uh, these very limited palettes, the paintings have an atmosphere, uh, and you know that's I enjoy that in my work. There's a graphic quality to the work that I that I enjoy. So uh, that's for myself. That's why I use uh, the historical pigments. But you don't have to. You could certainly use uh, any contemporary uh, pigments or, or paints uh, and get the same results. So um, I I, I so have also. I uh, had a lot of viewers uh, ask me about the historic oil painting mediums. And, um, and I want to talk about this very, very briefly. The, the mediums that I recommend on the channel are not perfect. Um, they're what, what I've researched and what has uh, been documented by museums and uh, restorers, uh, you know, of, of these paintings. So, um, by no means, you know, is a heat-bodied oil perfect or a sun-thickened oil perfect. Um, if you're looking for a very, very stable medium, liquid is a wonderful uh, uh, contemporary medium that you could use. But just there's also recognition that I that I want to, uh, uh, you know, um, bring forth here, and it's that these materials will age no matter what, but they will age gracefully, meaning that uh, 
painting that is slightly yellowed or slightly cracked has a beauty and that that there's an aesthetic to that um so uh i i you know i'm not looking for i recognize that the the painting uh the oil painting medium is not perfect and that there's a recognition uh that comes from just working with the materials that they're organic in nature um i'm not interested in the synthetic you know the polymers uh, so um, I'm interested in organic materials that they all sort of interconnect and there's a history and that makes me happy that I enjoy that the history of those materials so just be aware of that um, I have another question here uh, Fiorel uh, thank you for coming by I appreciate the question which black would you recommend using so I myself use vine black which is uh, ground up charcoal and bone black and the bone black I grind very very finely I you know I, I just put it on, a, on my stone slab and I'll grind it for three or four hours until it becomes almost like an ink and this is a glazing black and it's I use it for glazing and for you know uh, shadow passages the vine black I use for my grace and my flesh and I don't grind that one so fine so um, just different techniques. Uh, you could use those two, or you, if you want a very, very just universal black that is great for mixing tints, Vine Black is perfect. And you could just get it in any art store, or any brand has a Vine Black, um, you know, uh, or it's also known, I believe, uh, Carbon Black. Um, so yeah, so that, that'll work out just fine. And don't be afraid of the black. Do be careful when you, you know, when mixing your tints. Um, I think a lot of teachers, uh, you know, do not like the use of black because students do abuse black. They they just put it everywhere and it dirties the color. Uh, you know, in two in two minutes you will have a painting that went from being very bright to very muddy because if you're abusing black and putting black everywhere, so it's important to to know how to use it. And I use it very sparingly. Uh, I use it as a gray, uh, and I would mix a value scale. So uh, just be aware of that. So I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. Um, before we go, I want to tell you a little bit about my courses. For those of you that are visiting, that are probably just wondering, you know, uh, about drawing in general, just getting started, uh, I have some Udemy courses uh, available. Uh, in the description below, you will find the links. Um, these courses are highly recommended for anyone that's just getting started. Um, if you're, you know, wanting uh, information on value scales, how to mix, uh, or excuse me, how to uh, render a value scale, uh, the proportions, uh, how to, you know, uh, draw a nose or a mouth or eyes. Um, so I have three courses. I have a classical drawing course, a portrait drawing course, and an old master's uh, drawing techniques course. Uh, very soon, I'm going to be releasing uh, the Rembrandt uh, demonstration course. Uh, it'll be a, a full demonstration on uh, Rembrandt. Um, so, uh, yeah, check those out. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. So make sure you subscribe so you don't, uh, you know, uh, miss out on uh, the live presentations in the future. And I really appreciate the support. Um, the channel has grown in the past months uh, to, I believe, we're at 1,500 uh, subscribers. And I'm so appreciative uh, for your support, for coming by during the live presentations, for your questions, for your comments. Um, I'm very thankful. And uh, in two weeks' time, I will return with another live presentation. Um, so hopefully, we'll be focusing more on uh, techniques. So uh, again, thank you for coming by and have a wonderful weekend. Have a good one.